Thank you, Christopher. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Amos, chapter 2. We just sang that chorus, nothing is impossible when you put your trust in God. And then we sang, then put your trust in God alone. We're trusting in him, and so we're trusting in his holy word. Amen? It's the word of God that we read and learn and trust. And sadly, tonight, we're going to hear how the nation of Judah stopped putting their trust in the word of God. It was a horrific mistake to stop reading, to stop heeding, to stop placing your faith and trust in God's word. Amos chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Judah and for four, I will not turn away its punishment, because they have despised the law of the Lord and have not kept his commandments. Their lies lead them astray, lies which their fathers followed, but I will send a fire upon Judah, and it shall devour the palaces of Jerusalem. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your holy word, and I thank you that your spirit instills within our hearts a desire for the word of God. How I pray that we would be those who come and taste and see that the Lord is good as we read and study the word of God, place our faith and trust in you, and begin to develop that fellowship that you have made possible that we can have with you on the basis of the shed blood and the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, I pray that this word of announcing of judgment in the Old Testament upon the nation of Judah because they despised your word and did not obey your commandments, that it would just be an exhortation as well as an encouragement to our hearts to keep our mind and our hearts in tune with the word of God. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as I read it, it's a sad, sad announcement of judgment. Uh, there's a couple of important things before we look at a little of the details of some little pieces of history of the nation of Judah in the south. Remember, by the time Adis Amos is coming up, we have the ten tribes to the north, Israel, and then we have Judah and Benjamin to the south. And Amos has been preaching the judgment of God. He's at Bethel, that's where he is, where one of the temples that was erected with a built golden calf in the name of Jehovah, all of it is wickedness before God because it's disobedience of the second commandment, building an image and worshiping God on the basis of an image, uh, using priests from every tribe, not from the tribe of Levi, but from every tribe, and then setting up a house of worship in Bethel. They set up another one in Dan and put an image up there as well. All of these things. Amos comes up to preach judgment. He's there in Bethel, but he begins with the Gentile nations. And we've been looking at it together, how he preached the judgment of God upon Syria, the judgment of God upon the Philistines, the Phoenicians, focusing on Tyre, the capital city, uh, upon the Edomites, the descendants of Esau, upon the Ammonites and the Moabites, the descendants of Lot, and uh, all of them because of their uh, uh, atrocities against mankind. Now Amos preaches against Judah. That is, God's people in the southern half of the nation, where Amos himself has come from, and he announces the judgment of God for two reasons. They despised the law of the Lord, and they refused or they did not keep his commandments. And one leads to the next, by the way. Uh, disobeying or not heeding the word of God begins with despising. The word here in the Hebrew to despise means just to reject to just refuse it. They had no heart for it. They didn't come to hear the word of God. And it's an interesting thing. Why didn't they have a heart for the word of God? The answer is because they established their own designs going all the way back, Jehoshaphat. And uh, I'm sorry, not Jehoshaphat, Jeroboam, the first king of Israel. And he established this worship that I just described with a golden calf in the name of Jehovah. And, and when you disobey the word of God and substitute your own ideas for it, how are you going to go back to the word of God and fulfill it? Well, you can, but not without compromise. If you're going to just do your own ideas, and those ideas are in direct opposition to the word of God, 
then there's an evil compromise that has to take place. And it's easier just to neglect the word of God altogether. We started out on our own ideas. Let's continue with our own ideas. And that's exactly what the people of Israel did. And then they began to break God's commandments. They refused to obey the word of God. Now, we'll go through a couple scriptures. Let's go, first of all, back to the book of Leviticus, chapter 26. In Leviticus, chapter 26, in verses 14 and 15, the Lord spoke to the people of Israel when they were just one people, all 12 tribes, and he warned them of this very thing. In Leviticus chapter 26, we have the pronouncements of blessings and the pronouncements of judgments that God would bring upon his people, and all of them are in relationship to his word. Notice, I'll begin in verse 11. God said in Leviticus 26, 11, I will set my tabernacle among you, and my soul shall not abhor you. I will walk among you and be your God, and you shall be my people. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt that you should not be their slaves. I have broken the bands of your yoke and made you walk upright. But if you do not obey me and do not observe all these commandments and if you despise my statutes or if your soul abhors my judgments so that you do not perform all my commandments but break my covenant, I also will do this to you. And then now begins the series of judgments that God told the nation of Israel he would bring upon them. So God told them at the outset, the nation of Israel was in a covenant relationship with God and they were bound to do his law, his will. And uh, when we talk about that, we have to understand that when the Bible talks about certain men in the Old Testament, Job comes to mind, he wasn't of the nation of Israel. Uh, there was no nation of Israel as far as I know at that point, though he was probably roughly around the time of uh, the patriarchs. Job may have been living around the time of Abraham, if you examine the scriptures and the kind of things that are in both of those books, but there was no nation, the 12 tribes of Israel as of yet. But God describes Job as a blameless man, doesn't he? He said he's blameless. He introduced Job to Satan as if Satan didn't know him, <laughs> and he spoke of him as blameless. Now, this did not mean that Job was perfect. What it meant was Job had a heart for God. And as far as his testimony, he was blameless. He was not known for his sins. He was known for his fear of the Lord. That's the idea. He was a man who feared God. He was blameless. When we think of people like David, King David, now we are talking about the nation of Israel. God described David as a man after his own heart. Well, I don't need to go into any details to remind you that David was not a perfect man. As a matter of fact, David was guilty of many sins, breaking the commandments. David was not a perfect man, but he was a man who had a heart for God. So when we read expressions like I just read to you from Leviticus chapter 26, God is encouraging his people to have a heart for God and to seek to obey his word. And when they failed, there was provision for that. They needed to have a heart of repentance and confess their sins and walk with the Lord. That's what God's talking about here. And when we read in Amos chapter 2 that the people of Judah despised the law of the Lord and broke his commandments, what you need to understand is they lost that heart for God. They didn't fear the Lord, but they were consumed with themselves and what they were doing. And we have examples of that. Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 36. Jeremiah chapter 36. Now, I'm just going to pick a few examples uh, to share with you. And uh, this one directly addresses God said to the prophet Amos, who was before Jeremiah. This event takes place later in history. But to me, it really epitomizes the attitude of the people of Israel towards the word of God. There were exceptions, praise the Lord. We'll see one of them a little bit later on. But there were exceptions. But here's an example of despising God's word. In Jeremiah chapter 36, verse 1, it came to pass in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, that this word came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Take a scroll of a book 
and write on it all the words that I have spoken to you against Israel and against Judah and against all the nations from the day I spoke to you from the days uh, uh, of Josiah even to this day. So this is record the book of Jeremiah on a scroll, the whole thing. It may be, God said, that the house of Judah will hear all the adversities which I purpose to bring upon them, that everyone may turn from his evil way, that's repentance, that I may forgive their iniquity and their sin. Then Jeremiah called Baruch, the son of Neriah, and Baruch wrote on a scroll uh, of a book at the instruction of Jeremiah all the words which the Lord had spoken to him. Now, Jeremiah then commanded to Baruch to go to the temple and to read it because Jeremiah was being confined. He was under confinement. He was imprisoned at this time. And so that's what Baruch did. He went and read all these things in the temple. And uh, we see that in verse 8, Baruch, the son of Neriah, did according to all that Jeremiah the prophet commanded him, reading the book of the words of the law of the Lord in the Lord's house. Now it came to pass in the fifth year of Jehoiakim, uh, the son of Josiah, the king of Judah, in the ninth month that they proclaimed a fast before the Lord to all the people in Jerusalem and to all the people who came from the cities of Judah to Jerusalem. Then at this occasion, Baruch did it. He read the book uh, from the book of the words of Jeremiah in the house of the Lord in the chamber of Gemariah, the son of Shaphan, the scribe in the upper court at the entry of the new gate of the Lord's house in the hearing of all the people. When Micaiah, the son of Gemariah, the son of Shaphan, heard all the words of the Lord from the book, he then went down to the king's house into the scribe's chamber and there... All the princes were sitting, Elishama, the scribe, Deliah, the son of Shemaiah, Elnathan, the son of Akbor, Gemariah, the son of Shaphan. Notice, please, the next name, Zedekiah, the future last king of Judah, the son of Hananiah, and all the princes. They were all there. And Micaiah, Micaiah declared to them all the words that he heard. So, verse 14, all the princes sent... Jehudai, the son of Nethaniah, the son of Shelemiah, the son of Cushi, to Baruch, saying, Take in your hand the scroll from which you have read in the hearing of the people, and come. So Baruch, the son of Moriah, took the scroll, and he came. And now he reads it to all these princes who are gathered. Notice now in verse 16, They looked in fear from one to another and said to the Baruch, We will surely tell the king all these words. And they asked Baruch, saying, Tell us now, how did you write all these words? At his instruction? And Baruch answered them. He proclaimed, that is, Jeremiah did, with his mouth all these words to me, and I wrote them with ink in the book. Then the princess said to Baruch, Go and hide. I am thankful that when I read the word of God that the people at this church don't tell me run and hide. Praise God for people who have a heart to hear the word of God. Can you imagine this? Get the picture of the setting. Go and hide in Jeremiah. Let no one know where you are. Do you think they think that the king Jehoiakim is going to be so excited to hear this? No, no. Verse 20, they went to the king, into the court, and they stored the scroll in the chamber of Elishima and told all the words in the hearing of the king. So they didn't even bring the scroll with them when they told and reported these words to the king. And the king sent Jehudai to bring the scroll, and he took it from Elishama, the scribe's chamber. And Jehudai read it in the hearing of the king and in the hearing of all the princes who stood beside the king. Now, the king was sitting in the winter house in the ninth month with a fire burning on the hearth before him. And it happened when Jehudai read three or four columns that the king cut it with the scribe's knife and cast it into the fire that was on the hearth until all the scroll was consumed in the fire that was on the hearth. Yet they were not afraid, nor did they tear their garments, the king nor any of the servants who heard these words. Nevertheless, Elnathan, Delaiah, and Gemariah implored the king not to burn the scroll, but he would not. Listen, this is an example 
of despising the word of God to the point of destroying it. By the way, don't you love the details in the word? It says he read a couple of columns. Every aspect and every word that's in the scriptures is important and helpful. It's because they wrote it out in a scroll with columns. This is not a book like ours. It's all these columns, and it would just be, you keep moving the scroll, and you read more columns. He didn't get far. He didn't get the whole book read when Jehoiakim took up the scribe's knife because they would cut these leaves before they would put them together, and he cut it, and he burned it, and there was no fear to treat the word of God this way. No fear. This stood out to the Lord. Notice what God says, uh, in verse 28, this is the Lord speaking to Jeremiah again. Take yet another scroll and write on it all the former words that were in the first scroll which Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, has burned. And you shall say to Jehoiakim, king of Judah, thus says the Lord. In other words, there's more added now. This much that I'm about to read to you was not in the first scroll. It's in the second scroll. What does God have to say? God's responding. Thus says the Lord, you have burned this scroll, saying, why have you written in it that the king of Babylon will certainly come and destroy this land and cause man and beast to cease from here? Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning Jehoiakim, king of Judah, he shall have no one to sit on the throne of David, and his dead body shall be cast out into the heat of the day and the frost of the night. I will punish him, his family, and his servants for their iniquity, and I will bring on them and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem and on the men of Judah all the doom that I have pronounced against them, but they did not heed. Why? Because they didn't fear the Lord when they heard the word of God, but they responded to get rid of the word of God and destroy it. This is the most severe example that I can think of as an example of despising the word of God. But despising the word of God arises in a heart that just no longer has a heart for it. I just am going to neglect God's word. I don't want to hear God's word. And what does this do? It leads to the next step that we saw back in Amos, and that is those who refuse to obey the word of God. Turn back to chapter 17. Jeremiah chapter 17, verses 21 to 23. Jeremiah 17, 21, Thus says the Lord, Take heed to yourselves, and bear no burden on the Sabbath day, nor bring it in by the gates of Jerusalem, nor carry a burden out of your houses on the Sabbath day, nor do any work, but hallow the Sabbath day, as I commanded your fathers. But they did not obey, nor incline their ear, but made their neck stiff, that they might not hear nor receive instruction. We will not do what God has told us to do. And so the judgment of God is going to come on God's people. Why? Well, first they despised his word, but then what follows when you neglect the word of God? You begin to disobey the word of God. You don't keep the word of God. Turn to Isaiah. When we turn to Isaiah, we go back more than 100 years between Isaiah and Jeremiah. Isaiah chapter 5, please. An earlier prophet. Now, when, Isaiah is, when Jeremiah is writing, Israel, the ten tribes to the north are gone. They've been judged. We're not talking about that yet. But when we back up to Isaiah chapter 5, Israel, the ten tribes to the north, are still in existence. Isaiah is going to preach both to Israel and to Judah, though he will focus mostly on Judah to the south. He'll also still, still pronounce judgment upon Israel to the north, and both Isaiah and Jeremiah, like Amos, preach to the Gentile nations around as well. In Isaiah chapter 5, as an example of disobedience to the Lord, I'm just going to pick it up in verse 18, but this is the chapter that's full of woes. Verse 8, notice what God says. Woe to those who join house to house. They add field to field, and there is no place where they may dwell alone in the midst of the land. In other words, they were all developers. That's a, that's a modern word. They built all developments that left no place for the poor. They bought up all the land to make money off it. God hated it. 
Verse 11, woe to those who rise early in the morning that they may follow intoxicating drink, who continue night till with uh, wine and they continue into the night till wine inflames them, drunkenness. Notice in verse 18 where I want to pick it up. Woe to those who draw iniquity with the cords of vanity and sin as if with a cart rope. This is one of the most picturesque expressions in the Bible of people who are determined to do their sin. And I want to tell you, when you realize that the law of sin, sin always leads to more what? If you've been with us in Romans, you know the law of sin is very clear. Jesus said in John chapter 8, he who commits sin becomes the slave of sin. Listen to this expression. They draw iniquity with cords of vanity and sin as if it were a cart of rope. Here's their sin in this cart, and they're determined to move it along. And so with cords of vanity, emptiness and worthlessness, what are they doing? They're dragging their sin with all their strength. All their energy is put into moving their sin along. That's what sin does to people. It's a slavery. It's a bondage. And when you give in to sin and you don't bring your heart to God and have repentance, you become the slave of sin, and then you begin to look like a fool, dragging your sin along with the cords of vanity. You know, verse 20, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put light for darkness and darkness for light. I said those in the opposite order. God hates it when we say what is bitter is sweet, and we say what is sweet is bitter. He hates it. God is a holy God, and he's a God of truth, and he's a God where, th with God, things are very, very black and white. That's the way God is. He looks at things that way. And by the way, people tell us, well, everything is some measure of gray. And I do want to tell you, once you get into gray, all there are are shades of gray. That's true. That's all there are. But it's not white. It's gray as far as God's concerned. It's not about how much gray it is. It's about whether or not it's white with God. And God wants us to call what is holy, holy. And he wants us to call what is sin, sin. God wants us to promote what is right. And he wants us to rebuke that which is wrong. On it goes. God hates it when his people. By the way, this is not just true of the nation of Israel. This is true of any people, any people. God hates it when leadership deceives their people and turns it on its head and says that which is an abomination is a good, holy, healthy thing. May God have mercy upon the United States of America because we are calling evil a lifestyle, a chosen lifestyle. God calls it an abomination. And until we can turn our hearts and just repent, that's all you have to do is throw yourself on the mercy of God. He knows we're sinners. He sent his son to die and save us. It's a wonderful thing. Verse 21, woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. God hates it when someone is so self-righteous that no one can even show them the truth. They just won't see it. Woe to them. God hates it. Verse 22, woe to mighty men who drink wine, valiant men, intoxicating drink, who justify the wicked for a bribe. God hates these things. Notice what God says in verse 24. Therefore... As the fire devours the stubble and the flame consumes the chaff, so their root will be as rottenness and their blossom will ascend like dust because they have rejected the law of the Lord of hosts and despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. Therefore, the anger of the Lord is aroused against his people. He has stretched out his hand against them and stricken them and the hills trembled. Their carcasses were his refuse in the midst of the streets. For all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. That is, his hand in judgment against his people. Why? Because they disobey the commandments of God. Not only do they do that, back in Amos chapter 2, verse 4, then God said they embrace their lies. And they follow their lies. Does this sound strangely familiar? <laughs> People disobey God in his word. 
And then they develop lies. You have to put something in the place of truth. If you've left truth out, you need something. And so people develop lies, all kinds of lies. And then people trust their lies to deliver them. It becomes an ugly thing. Turn to Jeremiah chapter 7. <coughs> Jeremiah chapter 7. For the nation of Israel, I'm already drawing some application for us today. And I know I can do that because the United States of America was founded with the scriptures in our hands. We have had the word of God. This nation was founded by people who came to this land so that they could worship God on the basis of the scriptures. Our nation knows I believe God holds us accountable when we have his holy word. And uh, these things are very serious with God. We've developed our own lies. Evolution would just be one example when I'm talking by way of application. We deny the truth that there's a creator. It's as clear as the creation all about us. The heavens declare the glory of God. So you have to have a lie. You ha if you're going to throw the truth out, you have to have something. So you put a lie in its place, evolution. And then what do you do? you begin to trust your lie. Your theory of evolution becomes the answer of everything. Don't bother me with the truth. Evolution is my lie, and we follow our lies. In Amos chapter 2, verse 4, that's what God reprimands the nation of Judah for. Notice here in Jeremiah chapter 7, the word of, verse 1, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Stand in the gate of the Lord's house, proclaim there this word, and say, Hear the word of the Lord, all you of Judah, who enter in at these gates to worship the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Amend your ways and your doings, and I will cause you to dwell in this place. What's the truth for Israel? The truth is this. We saw in Leviticus chapter 26. If you listen to the word of God and you obey the word of God, God will pour out his blessings on you. I put my temple in the tabernacle then. I put my tabernacle in the midst of you. I will be your God. You will be my people. They push that aside. They no longer want to follow God and obey his word, and so they need a lie in its place. What's the lie they chose? Verse 4, do not trust in these lying words saying, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these. What are they saying? Well, God told them, not just Leviticus, Deuteronomy, very clearly, if you forsake me and my word, I will bring the judgments upon you. Well, they had forsaken the Lord, and they had no, attention, no intention of obeying God's word, amend your ways. They had no intention to do it. They were going to continue with their own desires, the dictates of their own heart. So what's the lie? Well, the lie is, here's the temple. God's not going to destroy his temple. The temple of the Lord. The temple of the Lord. We're okay. In other words, can I say this? I'm okay, you're okay. We're all okay. Why are we okay? Because we have the temple. The temple's here. God's not going to destroy his temple. We're his people. Here's the temple of the Lord. What does God have to say about that? Verse 8, behold. You trust in lying words that cannot profit. Here God's going to hold them accountable. Will you steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, burn incense to Baal, and walk after other gods whom you do not know, and then come and stand before me in the house which is called by my name and said we are delivered to do all these abominations? Isn't the heart deceitful above all things and desperately wicked? I can do whatever I want, and then the temple of the Lord. I'll just go to the temple, and everything will be okay. I'm here to worship God. He accepts me the way I am. Verse 11, God said, Has this house, which is called by my name, become a den of thieves in your eyes? Didn't Jesus quote right here? That's what he said to the first century people of Israel as they were merchandising in the temple. They weren't, it wasn't a house of prayer. It was a house of a means of gain. Behold, even I have seen it, says the Lord. But now go to my place which was in Shiloh, where I set my name at the first, and see what I did to it, because of the wickedness of my people Israel. And now, because you have done all these works, says the Lord, and I spoke to you rising up early and speaking, but you did not hear, and I called you, but you did not answer, therefore I will do to the house which is called by my name, in which you trust, 
and to this place which I give to you and your fathers as I have done to Shiloh. What happened to Shiloh? It was destroyed. Destroyed. Why was Shiloh destroyed? Ichabod. The glory was gone. And in the days of uh, Eli the high priest with Hophni and Phinehas and their wicked immorality right in front of the tabernacle, all these kinds of sins going on, and everybody just went on as if it was normal. There was no repentance. And so what happened? The enemies of Israel came up, the Philistines, and did God deliver them? No, God delivered them over to their enemies, and the whole scene was destroyed. And you know the story about how the Ark of the Covenant was captured and then let go and then moved from one place to another. It will not be until David is king that God will bring the ark to the capital city of Jerusalem and his son Solomon will build the temple. And God is now saying to the people who are saying, here's our lie. We've got the temple. Solomon built this temple. This is the name of the Lord. God was going to preserve us to do whatever we want to do. Well, they didn't say that, but that's what they were doing. That's how they were living. It was not so. God said, I destroyed Shiloh. I will destroy this place. And the people embraced a lie. Well, this judgment for Judah came in 586 B.C., some couple hundred years after Amos preached the message. And one of the reasons why was because there were a few exceptions of kings who were godly men in Judah. We'll look at one of them in just a moment. Turn to Jeremiah chapter 39, please. Just for a record of what God pronounced through Amos, what God pronounced through Isaiah, what God pronounced through Jeremiah came to pass in 586 B.C., Jeremiah chapter 39 and verse 8, you can read it, begins in verse 1. In the ninth year of Zedekiah, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar comes up against Babylon, uh, from Babylon against Jerusalem. This is his third time, by the way, coming up. He's already carried off captives, Daniel, and many have been taken captive, but this is the final time. And we read about in the eleventh year of Zedekiah, uh, he now breaks through the wall. The city walls of Jerusalem are penetrated. And then all the princes of Babylon come into the city. And uh, Zedekiah, verse 4, and Judah, the princes, they try to run and flee and get away. But they are pursued, verse 5, by the Chaldean army. They are captured by the Chaldean army. And in verse 6, a horrific thing. The king of Babylon killed the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes in Riblah. And the king of Babylon also killed the nobles of Judah. Moreover, he put out the eyes of Zedekiah, bound him with bronze fetters to carry him off as a prize to Babylon. And the Chaldeans burned the king's house and the houses of the people with fire and broke down the walls of Jerusalem. Can you find 2 Chronicles chapter 36? I should have told you ahead of time that this was going to be a sword drill tonight. Isn't it good to go searching through the scriptures? Be refreshed. These are still in your Bible. Good passages for us to be reminded and to tonight be sober about this. In 2 Chronicles chapter 36, once again, beginning in verse 11 through the end of the chapter, uh, through verse 21 is the judgment that came. 22 through 23 talks about how God fulfilled his word and eventually, hundreds of years later, will then bring them back to the land, sorry, 70 years later, after uh, the judgment was fulfilled. But I want to point out to you in chapter 36, verse 19, because I want you to see specifically what God said. Then they burned the house of God, broke down the wall of Jerusalem, burned all its palaces with fire, and destroyed all its precious possessions. And so the word of the Lord was fulfilled. The word that Amos pronounced in chapter 2 and verse 5, God said, I will burn this place with fire, is exactly what God did. He fulfilled his word. Why did God do this? Because they despised the word of the Lord. And then they began to disobey the word of the Lord. Now I told you that there were two exceptions. One of them is Hezekiah. Hezekiah will be the king of Judah, 
and the days when Israel, we're going to talk about it in coming Sunday nights, is going to experience the judgment that God pronounces on them at the hands of the nation of Assyria. Hezekiah will be king, and the Assyrians are going to come up to Jerusalem right up to the neck. And Hezekiah is just going to spread out the threats of the Gentiles before the Lord. And with a right heart, God is going to answer his prayer and deliver Judah at that time. There was another time that God delivered. Turn with me, please, to 2 Kings chapter 22. 2 Kings chapter 22. Both these exceptions, Hezekiah and Josiah. Young, young King Josiah, who was king in the days of prophet Jeremiah, a little more than 100 years later than when Isaiah was prophesying. We're told in verse 1 of 2 Kings 22 that Josiah was eight years old when he became king. Yikes! Imagine being placed as king when you were eight years old. A tremendous story of all this that goes on here. But notice in verse 3, when he was 18 years old, that he sent Shaphan the scribe, the son of Azaliah, the son of Meshulam, to the house of the Lord. And what he wants to do is take an assessment. What kind of work needs to be done to refurbish the temple? And I want to tell you, I didn't realize till I started reading 2 Kings a little more closely how the temple went through such abuse and then repairs, and then abuse, abuse, and then repairs. A bad king would come in and he'd shut it down. And then a good king would come along and he'd open it up. And then a bad king would come down and he'd rifle it and shut it down. And then a good king would have to come along and open it back up again. And there was tremendous disrepair. And so Josiah is trying to deal with this. And in doing this, as the men are doing what Josiah asks to make an accounting of what is needed and what is involved in opening the temple back up, they come across a scroll. And notice, please, I want to pick it up in, oh, let's see, uh, verse 8. Then Hilkiah, the high priest, said to Shaphan the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan, and he read it. So Shaphan, the scribe, sent it to the king, bringing the king word, saying, Your servants have gathered the money that was found in the house and delivered into the hand of those who do the work, who oversee the house of the Lord. Then Shaphan, the scribe, showed the king, saying, Hilkiah, the priest, has given me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king. Now it happened, when the king heard the words of the book of the law, of the law, that he tore his clothes, and he sent, and he sent to get word from the prophet of God of what God had to say about all of this. Turn to verse 18. God will send word back to, Josi to Josiah. And what does God have to say to the king? Verse 18, but as for the king of Judah, first of all, God says all the judgments you read about, they're coming. <laughs> Nothing's going to stop the judgments because of the wicked sin, especially Manasseh and some of these wicked kings. God's going to bring his judgment upon Judah for all their evil. But, verse 18, as for the king of Judah, who sent you to inquire of the Lord, in this manner you shall speak to him. Thus says the Lord God of Israel concerning the words which you have heard. Because your heart was tender and you humbled yourself before the Lord when you heard what I spoke against this place and against its inhabitants, that they would become a desolation and a curse, and you tore your clothes and wept before me. I also have heard you, says the Lord. And God promised that all of this judgment was not going to come in the days of Josiah. Why? Because he had a tender heart when he heard the word of God. This is precious. In Isaiah, the Lord said in Isaiah chapter 66, in the closing chapter of that book, let's go there. We have to go there. Isaiah 66. This is the closing passage for tonight. God spoke to the nation of Judah through the prophet Amos, and all that God pronounced in judgment upon Judah, the two tribes to the south, it came to pass, burned the palaces, 
burned the temple. Did it matter what the lies were that the people put in place of the truth? No. God's word will stand. It will be fulfilled. His word, the truth. And yet there were exceptions. There were those who despised and disobeyed the word of God. And then there were men like Hezekiah and men like Josiah with a tender heart. When they heard the word of the Lord, they repented and expressed emotion of response, an appropriate godly response to the truth of God. Notice here in Isaiah chapter 66, verses 1 and 2, thus says the Lord, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you build me? And where is the place of my rest? For all those things my hand has made, and all those things exist, says the Lord. But on this one will I look, on him who is poor and of a contrite heart and who trembles at my word. May God impress upon our hearts that the way we respond to the truth of his holy word, number one, he hears it, he sees us, and it matters to God how we handle his word. May we have a tender heart like a Josiah, a tender heart that when we hear the word of God, it moves us to appreciate the word of God, to respect the Lord who gave us his word, and to respond in a right way that betrays the fear of the Lord. God regards this. God regards the one who trembles at his holy word. Let's pray. Father, we are so very blessed to have your holy word, and we give you thanks for it. And I pray, Lord, that we, like the Old Testament saint, would fear you and have a respect from the word of God. We don't want to worship your, God, your Bible, the word of God, as some kind of an idol and carry it around and kiss it. We want to read it. We want to, with our hearts, listen to it, and we want to respond with respect for you because this is your holy word, and we want to respond by seeking your grace to obey it. Thank you, Lord God, for your spirit that you've sent forth, the spirit of God who gives us a heart to understand the word of God. May we ever approach, ever approach your word with a tremendous sense of fear, the fear of the Lord. And may we ever respond to your word that betrays a heart of faith. We thank you for the word of God. In Jesus' name, amen.